So hello everybody and uh, welcome to the uh, ESDR uh, kitchen. I'm Eli Sprecher. I'm from the Department of Dermatology at the Tel Aviv Medical Center. And on behalf of the board and my co-chair, Professor Kerdin Conrad, who will join us uh, very shortly, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this new episode of the molecular cuisine of the uh, ESDR kitchen. Uh, that's where leaders uh, in their field share their uh, personal journey to scientific discovery. I'd like to remind you that uh, the ESDR Kitchen program, as well as uh, previous episodes, are available on the uh, ESDR uh, website. So we'll be able to uh, look at those episodes or recommend them to your colleagues. Today, we are uh, particularly uh, delighted uh, to have with us uh, an outstanding, uh, world renowned speaker, Professor uh, Neil uh, Reynolds. Uh, Nick is a uh, professor of dermatology and director of uh, diagnostics at uh, Newcastle University. He's, uh, Honorary Consultant Dermatologist at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle upon Tyne, UK. After uh, qualifying in medicine from the University of London, he received his dermatology and academic training uh, in Bristol, Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA, and Newcastle upon Tyne. His clinical and research interests are centered on inflammatory skin diseases, computational models, artificial intelligence, and therapeutics. He runs uh, dedicated tertiary uh, referral clinics for adult psoriasis and atopic eczema. Between uh, 2016 and 2019, he was director of uh, Newcastle's MRC EPSRC Molecular Pathology Node, one of uh, only six such units that were established in the UK to bring researchers, uh, clinicians, and industry together to develop molecular diagnostic tools for personal medicine. He co-leads the skin and oral disease team of Newcastle NHR Biomedical Research Center. And for more than 15 years, he has worked closely with computational scientists to develop computer models of uh, psoriasis. And we'll, we'll certainly uh, hear more about that during his lecture. More recently, his work on AI has extended into multiple long-term conditions and uh, polypharmacy. Nick was the uh, inaugural chair of UK Trend, a translational research network in dermatology, the previous chair of the British Society for Investigative Dermatology. He was past president of All Society, uh, the ESDR, and he is immediate past president of the European Dermatology uh, Forum, the uh, EDF. He was a um, board member of the International Eczema Council, co-leads uh, the Educational Committee, he is a co-author and associate editor of Rook's uh, textbook of dermatology, and he has in general contributed widely to many educational and mentorship events. He has uh, uh, received a, a large number of honors and awards, including the Michael Fuel of the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, the Rudy Cormani of the ESDR, the Eugene, the Eugene Farber uh, of the SID, uh, and uh, as well as the Arthur Rook uh, oration uh, from the British uh, Association of Dermatologists. In, 19, eight, in uh, 2018, he was uh, selected as NIHR senior investigator. So uh, really uh, an amazing investigator, uh, clinician scientist, a role model for uh, many. And uh, we are very grateful, Nick, uh, for you to uh, take part to this episode. Just before start starting, I'd like to mention that uh, this episode is sponsored by uh, Admiral. I'd like also to remind you to forward your queries uh, through the chat or the Q&A functions, and we will have 10 minutes at the end of uh, Nick's uh, talks to uh, discuss um, uh, his lecture. Once again, Nick, thank you on behalf of uh, all of us for the opportunity to hear you today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ellie, and thank you much for that very kind introduction. And, uh, and thanks also to Curden for the invitation. So it's great to be here uh, on the kitchen series. I'm just checking you can see my full screen with the bridges of Newcastle in the evening sun. We, we can, we can. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, here's some of my disclosures, which reflect our kind of close collaborative networks. And so today I'm going to talk a bit about systems biology, which has really come back into the fore with a kind of a major interest in an AI, but it's really been going on for a number of years. And we've been collaborating with um, kind of colleagues in computer science in Newcastle and other um, uh, of the universities for at least 15 years. 
Um, and I'm going to briefly mention atopic eczema and then focus on psoriasis with some specific examples that have applied systems biology to, and then finish with some 3D modeling that is still uh, in development. Uh, so what is systems biology? Well, uh, it can be defined in many different ways, but essentially it's a kind of integrative holistic system uh, with a computer model at its center. And uh, the advantage of it is that it allows simulation and prediction of biological outcomes. You can test specific hypotheses. And as I hopefully show, you can identify knowledge gaps and then it all feeds back um, so you can improve the model. Any model is a model. It's not in any way trying to fully represent um, the system that you're trying to study. And you can have systems biology at many different levels, whether that be cellular level, tissue level, um, uh, or even as a whole um, uh, human model. Um, and this illustrates the kind of very interactive nature of the systems biology. So I think it's, you know, it really is fantastic for translational medicine now that we can interact with computer scientists. Many of our trainees are learning to code so they can get into understanding the, the details of the models. And, and so that everyone in this team really appreciates each other's input. And, and we found it a very interesting place to, to work and, and share ideas. Uh, and it means you can make you know, progress a bit more rapidly than every time having to go and do an experiment. You can just test it in a model and see if the experiment seems sensible. So the key thing, as far as I'm concerned, is being able to run these simulations and then predict outcomes, which means then it also lends itself to potentially being developed into precision medicine, which has again been a, a long time talked about, but still a little way off for inflammatory skin disease, I think. Uh, and then just to give you some background about the different models, um, we first uh, started doing this with stochastic models, which have a, a, an element of randomness. So Sophie so Weatherhead with colleagues, uh, uh, including Anil Waipat, develop this 2D model shown on the right. Uh, every cell there is programmed individually. So at the time, that was quite computationally challenging. And Sophie used to have to set the thing off, go to bed, and then see what it had shown in the morning um, because it took a long time to run. Um, and therefore, it wasn't very easy to do interventions in. And then more recently, we've been using deterministic models where you've got essentially differential equations um, based on knowledge gain from other parts of science that is then uh, tested to see if the model works. Um, and there's now increasing fusion of them. So we've recently been using uh, random and deterministic models together. And then you'll be aware of the, the big flurry of AI, which I'm not going to speak about today. Um, so we wrote this review back in 2019 about uh, eczema through the International Eczema Council and brought together this idea of uh, in silico models uh, leading to predictive models, leading to then testing in, in model systems such as skin equivalents. And, uh, and I think it's, it's quite a nice overview of the field um, and still I think is, is relevant today. And uh, Raiko Tanaka was one of the co-authors and she has done some seminar work in the eczema field. And just to illustrate one of her Papers. So, so this is a uh, uh, integrative and predictive modeling, and the model is based on differential equations. There are some uh, gates that control uh, the effect of stresses on the system, whether that be pathogens or immune responses, uh, and some of the gates uh, relate to um, flares. So, so you can have a flare and then go back to a, a steady state after a flare. But some of the uh, responses, for example, persistent inflammation uh, combined with barrier defect result in a, a kind of prolonged state that is really fixed and, and is, is somewhat irreversible, which I guess fits in with our experience in the clinic of, of managing atopic eczema patients who've, who've had inflammation going on for many years. Um, and she's developed this further and she's now developed some personalized uh, tools to, to build in and put, you know, predict what patient scores may go on to, to predict flares and see what potential interventions can mean. And I think what's very neat about the model is 
It also is built in what filaggrin mutations do, um, and it predicts that you get longer flares of more persistent disease. And I think that fits with our experience in the clinic, although experimentally, I don't think that's really been shown uh, strongly. Uh, our work, though, has mainly been uh, focused on psoriasis, and I'm just going to run through some of it uh, that we started, as I said, 15 years ago. And one of the drivers for it is very simple question about how does a psoriatic plaque uh, form? How does a psoriatic plaque remodel with therapies? And we see the same change whether you treat the, uh, the psoriasis with biologics, UV, or even topical dithranol. And whilst we understand a lot now about the immunology, I think there has not been so much focus on about what the cellular mechanisms are that lead to you know, a remarkable change in morphology, plaque thickness over a period of weeks, really. And, um, and we tested very simple hypotheses about whether the change in the epidermal compartment was due to apoptosis or cell death or uh, it was due to um, um, cell arrest, which was the kind of uh, given uh, um, thoughts in the field before we embarked on it. Um, and uh, we're still interested in UV, which some regard as a bit old fashioned, but I, I think it's still a fantastic uh, modality to study experimentally because it's very clean. You've got no issues about pharmacokinetics. The, um, the, the, the kind of uh, the, the wavelengths that are effective have really been defined through a seminal study done in the States by Parrish and Janacek back in 91. So we know, for example, 311 is very effective, used in our narrowband UVB. 290, even though it induces redness, is completely ineffective. And so we've we've used the, the two wavelengths to control for bystander effects, such as redness. And in this experiment that Sophie did as part of her PhD, uh, she radiated plaques on the back uh, with 29311, biopsied them uh, very shortly after irradiation, used three MEDs because, again, quite strangely, psoriasis can cope with erythematous uh, UV. And then we studied what happened. And, um, and to cut a long story short, we found very clear evidence that UV was inducing apoptosis early on um, um, and very clearly 290 wasn't, even though it was inducing the same degree of redness. The quantification on the right is, um, is a log scale, so you can tell it's profoundly different. And you can see that the majority of the green cells that are anti-active caspase 3 positive are in the epidermal compartment, but there are some dermal cells. And so if you double label the cells to show that UV, as you may expect, is not discriminatory about which cells it, it, uh, it affects, it kills all cells equally. And the proportion of the cells dying depends on the proportion that are present in the skin at the time of irradiation. Um, and so at the same time, in parallel, um, um, the, our team in, in, the, um, in the university, uh, Fedor Shlomov um, and uh, Paolo Zuliani, had developed this uh, deterministic model, um, which involves differential equations, uh, um, predicting how things are going to respond. And we could build into this model the, the, the doses of UV that we were given. So you can see that the UV increases during the course and then stabilizes. And, and we did a time course of the UV and that was built in. Um, and then we saw what happened to the dynamics of the different cell types, fairly simple with just three kinds of keratinocytes, dendritic cells and T cells. And you can see that during the course of the, um, of the, of the therapy shown in green at the bottom, uh, there's a gradual reduction in the compartment and you essentially get remodeling of the plaque. Uh, and what's interesting is that the model, if it's left, then gradually resets and 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 the um, and the psoriasis recurs, which again fits in that UV usually only induces temporary remission. Um, and we did compare, you know, what was going on. We'd, we'd clearly seen um, uh, apoptosis, um, but we wondered if growth arrest would be equally effective. But in the UV model, the time course didn't really fit you can see that the red line of growth arrest alone 
that the plaque doesn't clear until after the UV, which doesn't happen in clinical practice. It all happens during the treatment. So, so apoptosis is required. There probably is a combination of both, but the point being that apoptosis is, is necessary to get the dynamics that you see. And so with all that, we were able to build uh, a fairly simple model that had immune stimulus. We can now start psoriasis with an immune stimulus whether it kicks into a proper plaque or not depends on the strength and the duration of the immune stimulus. And we can clear it with UV um, by affecting the cell death pathway of all the cells in the proportion that we find in the skin. And what's relevant about the model now is that because uh, we've got it in this state, we can now individualize it. So we can, we can predict the UV sensitivity of individuals based on the trajectory of their response. So here you can see there are real patients, the patient PARSI data, uh, because patients are uh, attending very regularly, you can measure a PARSI easily during a, a UV course. And so you can get these very clear uh, trajectories of outcome. And then the simulated data is very close uh, to the red uh, crosses, as, you, as shown here. Uh, and moreover, if you get a flare, as occurred in this patient, the model then predicts that there's been an immune stimulus coming along, which you can imagine may occur as you start treatment, and uh, and so uh, and you can figure out in 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 theoretical terms at least what the strength and duration of that stimulus is based on what's happened to the trajectory. And if you get a longer and more sustained stimulus, as in this patient, then you don't. Uh, the UV isn't sufficient to get you back to uh, the, the normal uh, clearance if you carry on with the regular regime. Um, so here you can see that the regular regime is in black. You're not clear at the end of treatment. And in fact, the, 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 the prediction is you recur very quickly after therapy has been stopped. On the other hand, if you alter the regime in the middle of treatment based on the flare and switch from a simple thing of three times a week to five times a week, you can increase the uh, the effectiveness of the therapy and clear clear the patient on the computer. So the question is, does that really work in patients? And so um, we've really been testing that um, by uh, Alison Havel is a newly appointed consultant in in the in the uh, department has just done a pilot study of more than ninety patients where. Uh, we've we've seen pe patients who are slow to clear at three weeks. We offer them the opportunity to come five times a week, and uh, we're currently analysing the data. But what's clear is they're able uh, and willing to undergo that change in the treatment uh, system. So finally, in the last few minutes, I just covered the three D computational models, which is being led by uh, Danica Power Maligan, who's uh, in the computer science department here at Newcastle. Um, and um, and so the advantage of a 3D model over a 2D model or differential equation model is it, it reflects the structural uh, elements that we know are present in skin and in, in psoriasis. Um, and we can include uh, factors such as cell adhesion um, and cell repulsion, which uh, are clearly required to enable the remodeling. And so uh, Dilika's um, a, she's built a degree of randomness into the model. So where the stem cells sit is rather randomly determined. Um, and then other elements are, are governed by differential equations. So for each of these things, the differential equations covering the growth factors, calcium gradient, cytokines, um, to enable us to construct a 3D model. And it's taken a while to develop because each time you build in the parameters that you think are relevant from the literature, and you see if the model is stable and, and, and reproduces itself uh, or it crashes or you get uh, invasion into the dermis, which occurred early on. So there's quite a lot of fine tuning of all the parameters in, in, in these complicated equations, which I am not in a position to explain to you. But I, I think the, the, uh, the clever people in computer science understand them and, and they're able to model these important things about the rates of uh, uh, division, uh, the, 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 the proportion of cells that go on to be um, dividing or, or um, go into growth arrest. Um, and 
and as I've mentioned, they're, they're also able to build in how stem cells divide, whether they go horizontally or whether they, uh, particularly when they go to TA cells, they go, as it were, more vertically. And in order to uh, push the epidermis up or develop the um, uh, the, the extension uh, in, into the dermis that we see in psoriasis, then you need some repulsive forces as well as adhesive forces. So all these are built in um, and, and um, we're now able to um, get some kind of uh, representation of a psoriasis plaque developing in 3D with an immune stimulus coming along and uh, uh, um, producing increased uh, stem cells, TA cells, and then an increased differentiated department over a time frame that seems reasonable. Um, and I'll just finally show you, if it works, the video of this uh, to give you an idea about what the 3D representation enables. So you can see that um, the BT ridges are extending down into the dermis. The scale has to change because the, the psoriasis plaque is becoming much thicker. And remember that there's something like 15,000 cells in this simulation, each of which is programmed individually. Um, and uh, and then the, the number of cells in the model you know, triples essentially with the formation of the psoriatic plaque. So I'll um, finish by just saying uh, in this short uh, uh, kitchen vignette, I hope to have convinced you that Combining experimental and comp computational modeling is valuable. Uh, it's a very interesting thing to, to work in an interdisciplinary environment with colleagues and, uh, and come up with new ideas about how you can test things in the clinic or in a, in a skin equivalent model. Um, and it's this interaction that I think is going to be important in taking translational medicine uh, further on. Um, and yeah, so the, the, there's lots of people involved, uh, the computer science people we're absolutely dependent on. But as I said, increasingly, our trainees are now starting to learn the computer code so they can get involved and, and do some of this themselves. Um, and I always like to call out the patients who, who clearly uh, are centered to all this and are, are willing to un undergo experimental medicine studies, the research nurses without whom we won't get all these important measurements and the data managers who collect all the important data for us, and obviously the funding agencies. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nick, for uh, sharing with us this, uh, uh, this fascinating data. And I, first of all, let's have a look. Uh, so you are all invited to send your uh, questions, uh, comments to the Q&A or the chat options, but uh, while people are uh, still reflecting, I guess, on your lectures. I, I, listening to you, I was asking myself whether you think that uh, at some point uh, those uh, simulation uh, and uh, computers, computerized models may uh, at least uh, to some extent replace the need for uh, formal clinical trials, uh, which are, uh, I mean, this these are uh, perhaps even cleaner ways, if I, if I may say, to test uh, the, uh, the efficiency of uh, drugs, interventions, et cetera, when and those who yeah. are always, you know, we were always to deal with those confounders in our clinical trials and trying to um, uh, get rid of uh, noise, which can sometimes actually prevent us from uh, looking at uh, true signals. So how do you, I mean- Yeah, well, uh, Ali, that's a great question. I'll answer that in two ways, if I may. Firstly, I would say that the work today, I would say, isn't going to, it is not at a stage where it's going to replace uh, clinical studies. I think it, it complements um, uh, experimental medicine studies. And, and in fact, we've got to a point now where we do have a very single, simple algorithm that, um, that can, uh, for patients going through UV therapy, um, predict whether they're going to be clear you know, at three weeks, we look at what's happened to their, their PARSI scores over three weeks, and we can look feed that in uh, together with some demographic data and predict whether they're going to be clear at the end or not. And if they're not, then we offer them the chance of having um, an altered regime, you know. So that, I think, is is really important, and we need to test it formally in, the, in a study. We can't just assume it's going to work. So we need to do a proper study. Does the app help or not? 
but we need to see if in the pilot it, it works. And uh, in terms of the simulations of larger data, well, I think that's already happening to a degree. So, so people are now doing trial emulation in, in, in resources such as Bad Beer, and we've done a couple of those ourselves. So the, the proof of concept at the beginning was to, to show that, the, that a trial in real life data found similar results to clinical trials that were published. And, and that's certainly been shown. But, but the trial emulation modality has now been extended. And so you could potentially do trials that you've not done yet or would be very hard to do. And we're doing some of that in our AI work on multiple long-term conditions where you, you may think about altering for the sake of this argument an individual's uh, um, antidepressant based on their cardiovascular risk. And, and so you wouldn't easily be able to do a clinical trial, but you can certainly look in large GP databases such as CPRD and, and see if the data supports your hypothesis. So I, I think the, the models and the simulations are, are, are definitely uh, uh, coming along. Thank you. So we have some questions. Uh, the first one from Maria Sanskodina. Thank you for the talk. Which parameters do you take from the patients and which from the literature to build the model? Do you consider also testing drug impact or do you take this into, or do you take into account, excuse me, pharmacokinetics? Yeah, so, so the, um, the experimental medicine studies, the UV, we did, we did the biopsies very early on um, because we think we were interested to know what, what you know, how UV is impacting, and, and we, we wanted to test if apoptosis was a key mechanism. So we did it at, um, um, you know, between six and 24 hours. And then we did some further sampling during a course to figure out the time course of the apoptosis. Um, ethically and, and, and feedback from the patients, we've worked very closely with our psoriasis association, uh, is that patients are willing to undergo experimental biopsies like four to five millimeter punch biopsies. We think only doing a maximum of four or five biopsies per individual. And so we're careful that we choose the time. And patients have said to us that they would be willing, in, if we had a test, to have a biopsy that would inform which biologic, for example, they would be best suited to. And then we've done in sort, as, as uh, you may be aware from other talks by me and others uh, uh, through the ESDR over the years, you know, we, for those studies, we've done different timings. So we tend to biopsy those patients at baseline week one um, and week 12. And so we look at the dynamic cellular and transcriptomic changes that are going on. And we have got data, um, some of which was shown at the ISID, that we're now able to uh, have an idea about which biologics their inflammatory profile at baseline would suggest they're most suited to. Again, that needs to be tested formally, but um, uh, you know, doing these large scale studies and it, it requires um, you know, you know, hundreds of samples to be able to get that data into a form where you can make predictions about individuals and groups, because there's a lot of noise in the system. Um, so you can't do it on small studies. So I think that's that's where we are. Thank you. So we have another question here. Beautiful talk. What is the benefit of apoptotic deaths rather than growth eyes in keratinocytes to a low plaque clearance? And do other forms of cell death, non-apoptotic, have the same effect? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. So I think what it showed for us was that for, you know, obviously UV is known to induce apoptosis in normal skin. Um, but, and, and when we started, there was this dogma, uh, some of which was um, put forward by Brian Nikoloff's uh, work to say that psoriasis was resistant to apoptosis and you never saw it. So I think the point, the point was we, we challenged that and we showed that apoptosis does occur in, in plaques both at three MEDs and one MED. So uh, it clearly is uh, uh, there. And it makes sense to me about why you get such rapid remodeling of a plaque. Uh, otherwise, growth arrest would just take too long. I think in, in, in biologics, we, we have found that growth arrest is really important, and but the, the, the time of clearance is probably a bit slower. Certainly for the agents we've studied, we haven't done the studies with the newer 
faster working agents, but it would be fascinating to look. And we do see transcriptomic signals even in, in biologics for different kinds of cell deaths and pyknoptosis signals and that kind of thing. So I, I imagine it's it's been overlooked to a degree, which is why I think it's 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 very interesting. But if you think about the actual dynamics of how you have to get from a thick plaque to a thin plaque back to normal skin in a few weeks, it's hard to imagine growth arrest would do it alone. And and also if you're thinking about inducing remission, which is an increasing uh, area of work. To me, if you can uh, get rid of your key cells, whether that be your T cell memory cells or your uh, your driving stem cells in the, in the epidermis, that's going to be really helpful. Thank you. So there is a, a kind of a follow-up question here. What is the mechanism behind the effective and ineffective apoptosis induction of 311 versus 219? nanometer UV radiation, given that the 219 is more energetic than the uh, 311, so that would, uh, would, would intuitively think that uh, it should be the other way around. Yes, great question. Um, we don't fully know the answer to that, but we, we, we also did transcriptomic studies um, to show differences in the profiles between 219 and 311. And although 290 is more energetic, it actually, as you may be aware, penetrates less into the skin. So the um, it clearly is able to induce erythemus, which may be due to um, ROS induction in the epidermal compartment, which then induces further cascades downstream and in the dermis. But our hypothesis is that it's the DNA damage itself that is required to induce the, the apoptosis in the short term. And we, we certainly have found transcriptomic evidence of DNA damage uh, going on and DNA damage repair being activated in, in the plaque. So we think it's a direct effect of UV. I see. I think this will be our last question for today. Uh, is it feasible to introduce aspects such as stress or Kubner phenomenon into the, the psoriasis model? Um, uh, well, it is in part, isn't it? Because um, I think uh, you can test, as we can do now, what is the what is the length and strength of stimulus that you require. So, for example, when when Sophie was thinking this right at the beginning. You know, one of the key immune stimuluses that we are aware of for flaring psoriasis is streptococcal infection. And we know the time course of that, that's been well studied. It's like four days before the initial infection till you see a plaque appearing. So Sophie's built that into the model. And I guess the same applies to the Kerbner phenomenon. I don't know if the time course of Kerbner is known. Others may know more than me. But, but we know it takes a few days, doesn't it, to do that. So I think you can imagine that you need a, the stimulus to be of sufficient strength and duration to kick off the, the, the kind of system that is primed to go. I think that's how people regard it now. You, you've got a prime system and then something comes along and kicks it into, into a state. And then you're in a relatively fixed state, some of which you can reverse, but you've always got that predisposition. Um, and so um, can you overcome that long term and really induce cure? Um, I think that's the challenge that we all trying to think about. It isn't easy, but if it was easy, it wouldn't be so much fun. <laughs> so thank you very, very much, uh, Nick, for um, having taken part to uh, this molecular cuisine episode of the DSDR Kitchen. Uh, we have uh, all learn, uh, I think, a lot. So I'd like to uh, thank you all for having been with us. Uh, we will meet again for uh, our next uh, ESDR Kitchen uh, on the 23rd of August for a new freshly baked episode where we'll we will discover two new recent uh, studies. And uh, until then, uh, once again, uh, thank you all for having been with us uh, wherever you may be. And goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Ellie. Bye-bye.